Hey, 42 here. With the wide reach of the internet, we've all seen how fast a meme can spread. And then, before you know it, they're gone again like a ghost in the night. But this also happened before the internet too. Let's have a look at some crazy crazes and fabulous fads that took the world by storm. Now, in the modern world of consumerism, we all buy plenty of stuff that we don't need. In fact, that's probably most of what we buy. This means that selling us useless products has become something of an art form and led some people to wonder, what won't people pay for? In 1975, Gary Dahl gave a pretty convincing case that you really can sell absolutely anything. For just under $4, he gave you a smooth rock. One that you could have just picked up off the beach or a riverbank. Pet rocks were probably the biggest craze of the year. And although it died out within about six months, it was enough time for Gary to become a millionaire. Your rock came in a little box with a bed of straw and a 32 page user guide, explaining the difficult task of feeding, grooming and training your new best friend. He hit on the idea when he heard his buddies talking in a bar, complaining about having to take care of their pets, or lap food and poop and walks and eating your shoes and making your house hairier than a barbershop's floor. So what if you could avoid all these irritating issues and have a simple pet that loved you? Only the way that inanimate granite can love. A rock is cleaner than a dog, quieter than a hamster, probably friendlier than a cat, and at least as intelligent as a goldfish, it's a win-win. Gary sadly died in 2015, but he wanted everyone to share in his superior sales powers. In 2001, he wrote the famous Advertising for Dummies. Who the dummies were in this situation is not exactly clear. Whether it's rocks or cats, pets are hugely popular, and it seems like our love of cute animals is unlimited. But trust Japan to take it a little too far. Kigurumi are the animal costumed performers that you see at many promotional events, sports shows and so on. But the cutest army in the world burst onto the streets in the mid 2000s, seen getting on with their daily lives, dressed in a range of cartoon onesies. Japan has been obsessed with cuteness for a long time, and their term kawaii can refer to everything from clothing to shows to behaviour, even food. Who doesn't want a sandwich with an adorable face, right? Many trends have grown out of this, from the creepily named fashion of Sweet Lolita, which consists of lacy bonnets, bows and umbrellas, as well as whitening makeup, to things like Hello Kitty and Buriko G, a style of fake childlike handwriting. The most popular Kigurumen outfit was probably the little yellow rodent Pokemon Pikachu, partly because of the character's mass appeal, but also because the bright yellow colour masked a lot of the mustard and tea stains that your daily onesie wearing normally creates. The mighty power of cuteness could not be contained to Japan for very long. Soon, students across the UK and America were nursing their hangovers in furry style. It's hard to feel sorry for yourself when you're a unicorn. I think that's been proven by science. Speaking of science, our next craze shows just how quickly our understanding of something can change. In 1898, Marie Curie and her husband Pierre discovered radium, element number 88 in the periodic table. It's a metal and has a half-life of between 3.5 days and 1,600 years, depending on which isotope you're dealing with. For those of you who aren't quite sure, let me quickly explain the basics of what a half-life is. If you have an amount of a substance, which is radioactive, then its atoms are not completely stable, so they sometimes decay and send out particles of matter, alpha and beta, or energy in the form of gamma rays. The half-life is a prediction of how long it will take before half of the atoms in your lump of stuff have decayed. It's really more of a probability. The crazy thing is, if you had a piece of radium the size of a grain of sand with a half-life of 1,600 years, it would still be decaying at a rate of around half a billion atoms per second. So, back to the craze. When it was announced that radium could be used to attack cancer cells, people went radium crazy and it became a health fad. 
They put it in lotions, syrups, tablets, and plenty of other stuff. It was basically the kale of the early 20th century. Unfortunately, whilst kale is just a simple leaf, radium makes you sick to your bones, since it often causes cancer there. Marie Curie herself died of a cancer to her bone marrow, and it took us a while to come around to the dangers of handling the substance. Some of Curie's possessions, such as her old cookbook, are still dangerous enough now that they have to be stored in lead-lined boxes. The French government is still cleaning up traces of radioactive waste from the radium craze to this day. We didn't realise the problem soon enough, and it was used across Europe and America both in medicine and also for its glow-in-the-dark quality. A famous court case arose around the Radium Girls, a group of women who had been painting watch faces with radium paint, they would lick the tips of their brushes, and it was a few years before they realised that they were poisoning themselves. Speaking of paint, when I say graffiti, most people are going to think of street art, like Banksy or JR, or maybe you'll picture some toilet scribble written with a sharpie. But for as long as there have been bored people and walls, we've had graffiti. And one of the most widely spread doodles is Kilroy was here. It's difficult to pin down a real origin for this, especially because the quote and the image come from different places, but got combined at some point during World War II, probably due to all the soldiers hanging out and killing time together. The image was seen as early as World War I, known to Australians as Fu and to the Brits as Mr. Chad. He's ended up with plenty of other names over the years though, such as Herbie, Overby, Flywheel, Private Snoops, The Jeep, and Clem. The British Mr. Chad would often appear with a slogan saying, What? No tea? Or What? No sugar? as a complaint about rationing. As for the image, it could have been taken from lots of things. One popular idea is that it comes from electrical circuits. Since the Australian versions often had a plus and minus symbol for eyes and resembled the diagram for a sine wave, or even the Omega, a symbol for electrical resistance. The phrase Kilroy was here is American though, and is likely from a ship inspector called James J. Kilroy, who would sign the phrase on parts of the ship to show that he'd checked them. Since production during World War II was so fast, often parts would not get painted over, so Navy personnel would find his phrase scrawled in the most unlikely corners of the ship, and this is maybe how the legend was born. It was so popular in the 40s and the 50s that it's said to have been drawn on everything from the Great Wall of China to the Statue of Liberty, and rumour has it, even the moon. It's also popped up in plenty of books with a nod from Isaac Asimov, Robert A. Heinlein, Thomas Pynchon, and even Bill Watterson in everyone's favourite Calvin and Hobbes. You're at a party, and what better way to get things going than with a dance? It doesn't matter if you've got no rhythm, or you're not wearing the right shoes, because today's dance just involves walking under a stick. That's right, it's the limbo, the dance that's broke a thousand hips. It has everything you'd want from a dance, terrible music, awkward poses, and a high probability of horrific injury. The strange thing is, this dance originated in Trinidad and was originally performed at wakes. Nothing says, you will be missed, like rubbing your nipples against a flaming stick. The 1957 film, Fire Down Below, is where the dancer Julia Edward introduced a limbo to a wider audience, and Chubby Checker's hit single, Limbo Rock, in 1962, helped to popularise it. It's not as common at parties these days, it's hard to limbo to electronic music, I guess, but as a competitive sport, it's still going strong. The current world record holder is Shemika Charles, a local Trinidadian who's keeping the tradition alive. In 2010, she danced her way into the Guinness World Record book, shimmying under a bar, just 21.5 centimetres high. That's less than the height of the Guinness Record book itself. She even went all the way under a car. Limbo is part of a long list of dance crazes, allowing drunk uncles at weddings all over the world to look as ridiculous as possible whilst trying to show up their in-laws. Whilst most people can at least attempt to dance, our next craze was popular because of its innate difficulty. The Rubik's Cube is a multicoloured puzzle guaranteed to make you feel as dumb as a monkey holding a smartphone. Invented in 1974 by Erno Rubik, a Hungarian sculptor and professor of architecture, the cube is about 6x6 centimetres and has a 3D cross in the middle with 26 plastic cubes attached around it. 
The aim is to arrange the cube so that each side is all one colour. And no, you're not allowed to just peel off the stickers. Over 350 million Rubik's Cubes have been sold around the world, and it is the best-selling toy in history. It's notoriously difficult for most of us since there are a staggering 43 quintillion different combinations. But for a few fast-fingered brain boxes, it's a piece of cake, and the world speed record stands at just 4.9 seconds by 14-year-old Lucas Etter. Various other forms of the Rubik's Cube have appeared over the years, with increasing number of sizes and shapes, from a simple 4x4 cube up to a Yotaminx. Now, a Yotaminx is a regular dodecahedron, meaning it has 12 faces, which are all pentagons, which are divided into 15 by 15 pieces. It needs 2,943 parts to make it. If you do manage to solve it, it opens up a much more important puzzle, which is, what are you doing with your life? Our next craze was also a puzzle of sorts, but the pieces were people. In the late 50s, phone booth stuffing became a challenge that spread through colleges across North America, Britain, and South Africa. And on the 20th of March 1959, a world record was set when 25 South African men managed to cram their way into a phone box at the Durban YMCA. And this remains the record. Despite the many different attempts made and a variety of techniques that students dreamed up whilst doing their best to avoid any actual work, a Canadian school managed to get 40 in a booth. But they had tipped it on its side and used one that was already larger than average. So, rules were set up regarding the size and the position of the phone booth, as well as how much of a person needed to actually be inside to count towards the total. The Brits took it one step further, since we're sticklers for doing things properly. You had to make or receive a call in order to complete the attempt. Yeah, hi mum, um, I'm just in a phone box with 39 other people. I think I might be late for dinner. If you want to try it for yourself, then the sooner the better, for the mighty phone booth is becoming extinct. In the US, the peak number was 2.6 million in 1995, but that number has plummeted and it's now well under 500,000 and dropping every day. With the prevalence of mobile phones, a phone booth is basically a tiny smelly museum with bad advertising and some suspicious flyers. If you were thinking about making a call in Brazil, however, and leafing your way through the phone book to look up a number, you might start to notice a rather wonderful Brazilian craze that is still going on to this day giving your children crazy names. In some countries, such as Denmark, there are very strict laws around naming a newborn. There is a list of approved names, and the name must correctly indicate the gender of the child. In Brazil, though, it's practically a competition to see who can come up with the longest, obscurest names, referencing everything from historical figures. For example, Francisco Lyndon Johnson Menezes da Luz Jr., also, numbers such as Deset Rosado, or office equipment even, like Xerox Porfirio. So, what's the reason for all of this? Well, it's hard to say exactly. No doubt the rich history of immigration and colonialism had a big impact on the naming culture. Also, there's been a feeling of higher class attached to some countries outside of Brazil by its residents, such as the US for example. So, therefore, names associated with these countries probably hope to adopt part of their perceived glamour. Although I'm not quite sure a Lud Jose Ribeiro would agree. This footballer's first name is supposed to be Hollywood, but the Brazilianization has lost a little something along the way. He's not the only comically named player either. He's beaten by Creedence Clearwater Kuto. So, what if Brazilian folk tire of being referred to as Mautet on Lima da Mora or Oceano Atlantico Linhares? Well, you can legally change it, but the court system is very slow and difficult, and many people just choose not to bother, embracing their parents' decision and buying an extra wide ID card. Our final fad is one close to my heart, because I played it on many a sunny afternoon back when I was a kid. It is the ferociously competitive game called Conkers. Conkers are horse chestnuts, known as buckeyes in North America and they usually start falling from the tall trees in their green spiky shells around the middle of September. Unlike their brothers, the sweet chestnut, which have a much spikier shell and pointed seed, 
They are not edible. In fact, they are very mildly poisonous. But since they are found lying around outside schoolyards, the kids were smart enough to put them to good use. The aim of conkers is to smash your opponent's conker. You drill a small hole through the middle of the conker and then attach a string. You then take it in turns to strike the other person's conker until one of the conkers cracks. It's basically British Pokemon, with conkers instead of Pokeballs and cute furry animals. There was actually a classic N64 game called Conker's Bad Fur Day, but it was a platformer about a dirty-mouthed squirrel rather than a very niche conker battle simulator. Typing Bovril Bullet Hole in the cheat menu here would give you 50 lives, but cheating in actual conkers required a lot more effort. Some of the more popular methods for cheating were boiling them in vinegar and then baking them, or painting them with nail polish. But if you really want to be king of the playground, World Conker Champion Charlie Bray claims that the best is to pass it through a pig. The conker will harden by soaking in its stomach juices. Then you search through the pig's waist to find the conker. Hey, sometimes you've got to get your hands dirty if you want to be a real winner. We roll our eyes at every stupid new fad that comes along sometimes, but we all know, deep down, that we've been a part of something just as ridiculous before, and probably will be again. That's what makes life interesting, right? Thanks for the view, subscribe for more 42.